Hola, Dolores Huerta. Espero que estén bien. And um, I hope you're washing your hands and getting in between all the little nooks and crannies. Um, I have for International Women's Day, which was this last weekend, and also Women's History Month this March, I wanted to share a couple of stories of girls who are doing work in the community now. They're alive and well and young people that are doing really good things. So this is a compilation. We have it in the library called Rad Girls Can, Stories of Brave, Bold, and Brilliant Young Women by Kate Schatz and Miriam Klein Stahl. And there are a lot of them, so we can't read all. Um, and I'm going to try to pull up a picture of who these people are so you can have an idea. Let me see if I can. Let's see. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. All right. I'll just show you the illustration. You can look it up on your own. Oh, no. All right, the Climate Kids. First filed in the U.S. District Court for the District of Oregon in 2015. There are many ways that young people can help protect and preserve the environment. You can recycle, compost, and conserve water and electricity. Another option, you can sue the federal government as Hazel Von Umerson, Victoria Barrett, Jaime Butler, and Jaden Fontlin did. You're among, they are among 21 climate activists under age 21 who are plaintiffs in a landmark court case. It's important that I'm doing this at a young age because it inspires people of my generation to help. You don't have to wait until you're older. That's Jaden Fontlin. A plaintiff is an individual who brings a case to court as opposed to the defendant whom the case is brought against. In this case, the defendant is the president of the United States. And the plaintiff is a group of young people who argue that the U.S. government has actively contributed to climate change. By doing so, the government is violating the constitutional rights of young people. The plaintiffs argue that having a healthy climate is a fundamental liberty for today's children and the children of the future. The plaintiffs range in age from 11 to 21 and come from all over the United States. They've all witnessed the impact of climate change on their lives in many different ways. Some come from urban areas like 18-year-old Victoria, whose school shut down after Superstorm Sandy flooded New York City. 17-year-old Jaime lives with her family on a Navajo reservation in Arizona, where a devastating drought has dried up the natural springs that her family has relied on for generations. 14-year-old Jaden, who is from Louisiana, has already experienced two floods in her home, caused in part by rising sea levels along the Gulf Coast. The plaintiffs don't argue the case in front of the judges. They have grown up lawyers who do that. Their job is to tell their personal stories of how climate change impacts them. They attend as many of the court hearings as possible, and they also act as spokespeople for this important lawsuit. In the process, they get to learn a great deal about law, government, the judicial process, the science behind climate change, and what it means to be a climate activist. 13-year-old Hazel joined the lawsuit because she is concerned about climate change and wants to show that young people aren't just playing video games on the couch. Her friends think it's cool that she's part of this big lawsuit, and she says no matter what happens with the suit, whether they win or lose, she knows she'll be fighting to protect the planet for the rest of her life. That's the climate kids. All right, the next one I'm going to read you is Sky Brown, who is... She was born in Miyazaki, Japan in 2008, so she's 12. In the summer of 2016, here's Sky. A skater named Sky Brown competed in the Vans US Open, a major skateboarding competition. In front of a huge cheering crowd and live television cameras, Sky dropped into the bowl and immediately nailed a front side nose blunt, an incredibly hard and dangerous trick. The crowd went wild, and the announcers were amazed. Half of the pro guys competing here can't do that trick, exclaimed some announce one announcer. The reason he was so impressed? Sky had just turned eight years old, and Sky is a girl. In fact, she was the youngest girl to ever compete in that competition. But after she landed the sweet move, 
she fell off her board. What did she do? She got right back on it and continued to blow everyone away. Sky's mom and dad are both surfers and skaters, and they've always encouraged her to go for it. When she was really little, her dad would bring her along to the skate park on the beach. As she watched the adults and big kids, she realized that she wanted to try it too. She started skateboarding at age three and learned to surf at four, and she hadn't stopped since. When there's a bunch of boys skating, you don't have to be afraid. You just got to go. Sky is already great at what she does, but she's always trying to get better and learn new tricks. To do this, she practices almost every day and watches her favorite skaters and surfers on YouTube and takes big risks. She knows that you have to fail a lot of times before you finally perfect a new move. Sometimes that means failing in front of friends or wiping out on a big wave, which can be embarrassing and painful. Scrapes and bruises are a reality and there's always the potential for more serious injury. But for Sky, the feeling she gets when she's going super high on her board on a ramp or riding on top of a big swell makes it all worth it. And safety is important. She always wears a helmet and full pads, elbow, knee, and wrist when skateboarding, and she never goes out alone. Skating and surfing with friends keeps her safe, and it's also what makes it so fun. Um, Oh, Marley Diaz. I wanted to read to you about Marley Diaz, but I lost the page. Let me see. There you go, 55. All right, you may have heard about her, Marley Diaz. She was born in West Orange, New Jersey in 2003. She's a little bit older. 11-year-old Marley Diaz loved to read. She loved getting lost in a great story, imagining new worlds, and learning new things. But the more books she read, the more she noticed that most of the main characters, especially in classic books, were boys, mostly white boys with dogs. Marley didn't mind reading about boys and dogs or wizards or unicorns or fairies, but as a young black girl, she also wanted to see someone like herself as the main character. She wanted to imagine herself as the hero. You don't have to be very old to start trying to fix the problems you see in the world around you. Marley decided to do something about it. She began by doing research to see if anyone else had noticed this problem. She learned that less than 10% of children's books published in 2015 had a black person as the main character. And of 3,400 children's books published that year, fewer than 100 were about Latino characters. And even though children's books have gradually become more diverse, many libraries only have the older books that don't reflect this shift. Diversity in books benefits everyone. It gives us a broader understanding of who we are as a nation and a world. Almost half of the children in the United States are children of color, so why should almost all the books be about white kids? Marley wanted more diverse books to be available for everyone, so she started a campaign to collect and donate about a thousand books about black girls so that more girls like herself would have access to books that reflected their experiences. She was excited about her new idea, but how exactly would she get all those books? She decided to use social media and spread her message with the hashtag 1000 black girl books, and it worked. Frustration is fueled and lead to the development of an innovative and useful idea, she says. Within months, Marley's campaign got the attention of writers, librarians, booksellers, and other people across the country, and the books began pouring in. Journalists wrote stories about her, and soon Marley had more than 4,000 books to donate. She had exceeded her goal, but Marley was just getting started. She continued to collect books up to nearly 10,000, created a resource guide for educators, and used her newfound media attention to speak to broad audiences about the importance of diversity in kids' books. She even got to interview Hillary Clinton and edit her own online zine for Elle magazine. And eventually, the girl who loved books got to write and publish her own book, A Guide to Activism, when she was just 12 years old. And our last one for tonight is about some local girls here in Oakland, in the Bay, the Radical Monarchs, founded in Oakland, California, 2014. There's a chapter in San Francisco, too. They may earn badges, but when these girls march through the streets, they're not selling cookies. They're leading protests. 
And if you look closely, you'll see that these aren't your average badges. Coding, healing, entrepreneurship, you got it. These are the Radical Monarchs, a social justice troop for young girls of color who want to learn about community, history, self-love, and activism. The Radical Monarchs started when Lupita, a fourth grader who went to Fairmount, wanted to join a Girl Scouts troop. Her mom thought it was a great idea, but was concerned that Lupita, who's a Mexican-American, would be the only girl of color in the troop. Lupita's mom asked herself, what would it look like to create a social justice troop that focused on girls of color? She casually mentioned the idea to Lupita, and the budding activist would not let it go, begging her mom to get it started. We are still kids, but that doesn't mean we are not powerful. Luna, age 10. Lupita and her mom reached out to classmates and friends, and soon Troop 1 was born, with 12 girls between the ages of 9 and 11, and two grown-up troop leaders. The curriculum is shaped by what the girls want to learn. They've camped, hiked, gardened, and visited a Native American sweat lodge. They combine activism and current events with useful, powering, empowering skills. When all the girls got excited about learning how to code, the troop leaders designed a whole unit around it. The monarchs got to learn the basics of this crucial computer skill, and they even designed and built their own original projects, social justice emojis, and an app that lets you take a selfie with a historical role model. A unit on radical entrepreneurship enabled the girls to identify the kinds of projects products they'd like to make and sell. And soon they were making their own body oils and earrings. And a unit on radical beauty focused on developing positive body image and self-esteem, messages the girls are actively sharing back at school. The monarchs also focus on doing. When issues arise in their communities, they discuss them. Many of the girls were upset after the 2016 presidential election, so they talked it out, asking each other, what do you want to do? The girls decided they wanted to march and speak up on behalf of their city and community. So the Radical Monarchs joined 60,000 other concerned citizens at the Women's March in Oakland, California on January 21st, 2017. Several weeks later, they spoke at a city council meeting where they advocated for Oakland to become a sanctuary city that protects and stands up for all of its residents, even those who might not have the same citizenship status. Of course, they have also faced criticism. Some people think it's inappropriate for girls to learn about complicated political and protest histories. Others think they shouldn't be taught to march in the streets or hold Black Lives Matter signs. But the monarchs will tell you that they're already aware of injustice. They see it every day in their neighborhoods and schools and in government. They're developing the tools to navigate the world with confidence and to work to make it better. And to those who say they're being brainwashed, Girls get brainwashed by the media every day, they reply. The radical monarchs are undoing the brainwashing. All right, Dolores Huerta, I hope you have a good night, and I will see you tomorrow. Be well and take care.